Hi, I'm David Lee, and I'm here to explain what the difference is between Mark II and Mark III. What is the Mark III all about? When we had the Mark IIs out, they were fantastic and popular, and there were no reasons to change for themselves. But there were things that could be better, and we're always trying to make things better. So what we saw that could have made things better were to expand the choices in terms of what you can do with them, uh, with the uh, processing changes, uh, to move into areas that maybe your particular system or your particular market needed. And we found that there were several things that folks wanted from a portable speaker that nobody was really offering, but we always wanted to make it possible because the one of the major objections to powered speakers that always seemed to come up when things got just a little bit bigger was taking them outside, taking them outdoors, you know, because in a lot of parts of the country, particularly in parts of the country where uh, there's a, a market for outdoor events, it rains and uh, it always rains on, you know, the big holidays, it always rains on the picnic. So you want to have a system that you can take outside. And people were constantly nervous, I think, about taking their speakers outside because, you know, what if the water gets where it's not supposed to go? Now, to be clear, we didn't make these things totally waterproof. What we did do is we put waterproof electrical connectors on them so that if water does get on the power connector, it's not going inside of it. And we put water resistant and mechanically robust connections in terms of the input connectors. Mark II series uh, subwoofers and tops, if you were unfortunate enough to get water into them, it could get into the DSP. Mark III, that's not possible. So Mark II had regular um, PowerCon NAC, the blue power connectors, and they are not technically watertight and they're not what they call a braking connector, which means that it, it shouldn't be connected and disconnected under load. The True One power connectors on the Mark III's are both watertight, uh, IP65 rated, and they have braking capacity, which means you could effectively use them as the power switch and they can do that thousands of times over their lifetime. And so both of those things are features that were added to the Mark III that make it a little bit less limited in terms of where you can go, what you can do with it. Now, to be clear and practical, you still don't want them facing the sky when it rains so that the water goes into the tweeter and pools in there and gets into the electronics. That's obviously, we're not saying they're waterproof, but the connectors on the back are more robust than they were in the Mark IIs. And if you get a little rain on them, you know, obviously cover them up if it starts raining, you know, practical things. Uh, but again, the concern that you might have had for something getting a little bit of rain on it is largely alleviated by the, the new connection types and uh, internal design of the Mark III amplification. Now, perhaps that's not the most important thing to most folks. And truth be told, it wasn't the most important thing that, that we thought of in terms of, of uh, updating the Mark III's. The most important thing was performance related. And so what we wanted was a more robust, more capable DSP. So the DSP that we used in the Mark IIs was closer to its capacity for what it could do. The touch button accessible presets on the Mark II, there were four. On the Mark III, we've doubled it to eight. It gives you the ability to choose presets just a little bit more refined in terms of the steps. Uh, if you spend the time to really listen and, and, and choose them, they dial in really, really nice and smoothly. And there's just a little bit more control that you have within that context. It's also a higher sampling rate. So instead of being a 48 kilohertz sampling rate, these are now a 96 kilohertz sampling rate. Um, and the codecs the, and the 
digital to analog, or well, technically, I guess you should do it in sequence analog to digital and digital to analog converters in them are higher quality and they have uh, just overall, they have a lower noise floor. So the, the dynamic range is increased. Mark III now has more information provided via the um, LEDs on the back. Uh, there are indications now of uh, signal present. Uh, there is an indication of uh, levels on the signal. There's uh, three steps of level so that you can kind of gauge how far you're pushing it. It has a compressor active LED, which tells you when it's actually reducing the gain in order to not clip effectively. They, they really are set up, they, they, they effectively can't clip. There's so many layers of protection within this thing that you will not be clipping the amplifier. You will get the limiter long before it will clip. If you continue to, you know, just add gain, it's going to compress more and more and more. And at some point, the quality of sound will deteriorate the further you push it into the compressor. That's not unique to these compressors, that's any compressor. So even if you had an outboard processing system on a different you know, piece of gear, you, you, that, that's, a, that's a universal. What we've done is try to make them get as loud as possible with multiple layers of protection without putting them at risk. If you invest in these things, we're hoping that you will look after them and you will listen. And if you hear anything that isn't as pristine as they are as they come out of the box, then lower the level because no matter how loud we make them, um, we can't make them infinitely loud. So there, there's always going to be a limit and the limiters will keep them from getting into danger. There is a thermal overheat LED that will come on and, and the system will lower its level to ensure that it doesn't go into thermal overrun and just overheat and shut down. So it'll, it'll lower its level. That, there's an LED that will indicate that that process is active. And if you're in that situation, you just can't expect it to get louder. You have to adapt downwards. If your speakers are in sitting in the blazing sun in a hot day um, and you want to push them extremely hard, they have fans in them. They have a thermal triggered fans. Um, pretty much everything except the SV9 has two fans. The SV9 has one fan and they'll start to move air across the heat sinks if they get to a point where they're uh, warm enough. But if there's nowhere for the heat to go, for instance, if the ambient temperature is so hot that they can't cool, there's another layer of protection that will keep them uh, from getting into any situation where they might be damaged. When you're looking at power allocation, your low frequency section needs a lot more power when you start looking at the math. You've got a thousand hertz and up requiring a small amount of power in terms of watts and uh, the, the mid-range down requiring more and more and more and more the lower you go. So uh, having only 800 watts on the high frequency section is still well in excess of what you need to run a compression driver. And so we benefited from being able to increase the output of the loudspeaker by using an asymmetrical amplifier. We have more power that we can actually use going to this big four inch voice coil uh, woofer here or the dual three and a half inch voice coils in the AT212 or the MFLA. They all get a substantial channel to be able to utilize everything that we can get out of them. And the high frequencies have plenty of power to be able to keep up. And, you know, generally speaking, in case it's useful to know, high frequency devices are also significantly more efficient. So for the power that you get in, you get more SPL out. And so that's the other reason why you don't need very much power for high frequency drivers. They're very lightweight diaphragms and the nature of the fact that they're horn loaded gives them an efficiency advantage significantly higher than uh, a direct radiating mid slash low frequency driver or subwoofer. So for those of you who already own Mark IIs, 
The Mark III is compatible with the Mark IIs, and you can combine Mark II subs and Mark III tops, Mark III subs and Mark II tops. They will work together. That is baked in. The good news is if you haven't bought Mark IIs, you get an upgrade in the sense of the Mark III. So you have an opportunity to get something that is uh, even better than what the previous generations were, more output, more control, uh, and a lot of cool features. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you and answering any questions that I may not have covered in this video, but hopefully you now know what the Mark III does compared to the Mark II, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in a future video. Uh,